Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone out there in Facebook land. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Lewis Reyes, and I am your exchange's senior enlisted advisor. I am super excited today because we have a legend with us. And, and let me tell you something, right? Well, a lot of you know I don't like sports. I don't watch sports. I'm not big into sports. Not that I don't like them, but I'm just not big into it. But when I watch highlights, I hate when they take out the commentators and what they say, right? That's like the hype play. You know, when the commentators, oh my God, he's going from the 50, the 40, the 30, he's gonna make it. Like, that's the hype. That's what <laughs> rushes your adrenaline during the play. And you keep replaying it and replaying it. And you're like, oh, that play was awesome. But the, the commentators, like the broadcasters have a lot to do with that. So before we get to our special guest today, let me introduce my co-host, Julie and Leah Matthews, or Julie Mitchell and Leah Matthews. How are you ladies doing today? <laughs> That's we okay. share a last we, name now. We, yeah, we share a lot. That's fine. <laughs> Good to see you guys. <laughs> hey, let's let's get this going, Judy. You mind introducing our guest? We are so excited to have a legendary broadcaster with us today. Chances are, if you've ever seen a highlight of the Dallas Cowboys, you've heard his voice. He's been with the Cowboys for more than 40 years, has won the Texas Sportscaster of the Year Award an incredible 11 times, y'all, and is a member of the Texas Radio Hall of Fame. Please help us welcome the voice of the Dallas Cowboys, Brad Sham. Ooh. Brad 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 Brad, 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 Brad. Cowboys, Cowboys, Cowboys. You're Cowboys. tired. You're, you're going to do all my intros. <laughs> hey, sounds Got good. Got yourself a new job. Woo! <laughs> you know, they say there's a saying in football, the more you can do, the harder it is to get rid of you. So I think that's... <laughs> Brad, thank you so much for taking time to join us. We really appreciate it, especially knowing that you know, you're preparing for football to get started again. And for everybody watching, drop a note in the comments. Let us know where you're watching from. And if you have any questions for Brad, we'll be reading those live throughout the broadcast. Now's a good so, time to start your watch party to enjoy this live with your friends. And if you don't follow us, you should because Chief Chats are every Tuesday and Thursday. And sometimes Minimum. Wednesdays, sometimes Fridays. Sometimes Fridays. Mondays. You never know. Maybe Just tomorrow depends. we'll be here. <laughs> but then you'll know who's coming up next. That's true. So let's get this going. Special guest today, Brad. Great to meet you. Thank you so much for spending time with the Exchange family today. Can you tell us where are you coming to us from and how have you been this summer? Uh, Chief, thank you. I am uh, I'm at my home in Dallas uh, and I've been fine. I've been um, uh, blessed, you know, if you look around and see people who are having real problems and so many millions around the world truly are, then um, being somewhat confined and losing a few vacations and uh, that doesn't seem like anything that merits a complaint. And so now it's just time for my work season to start and I don't have any idea what it's going to look like other than different than what I'm used to. But let's go. Oh, love it. Love it. Brad, 40 years with the same team. Man, that's quite an accomplishment. How did you get started with the Cowboys? And did you ever imagine you would be with them for so long? No, um, you, you, Julie, you can't ever imagine anything like that. Um, I, I'm really, the older I get, the more I think that it's uh, more than serendipity. I'm, I am a person of faith. And so I believe that there are very few accidents in the, the universe. I don't think everything's scripted, but I think some things are, are what they're supposed to be. Um, and I, uh, in, in one sense, I'm here because uh, while I was on uh, active duty at Fort Polk, Louisiana in the summer of 1970, which is, by the way, not a way to spend the summer that I would <laughs> Yeah. Uh. And if I was an 11 Bravo, so there was absolutely nothing exciting about it. Isn't that uh, infantry? Is that infantry? That, that is and was. That's infantry. That's, that's what we called a grunt. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, we were, I, I was National Guard, and so we were being trained to go fight the Vietnam War. And people in my platoon and my company, uh, both in basic and in AIT, did that. And I was one of the fortunate ones who, because I was natu National Guard, I, I went home. Uh, but, but 
while I was there, Julie asked me a question. I'm trying to actually keep the thread of the question. To <laughs> no, you give her answer. The, while I was at Fort Polk, uh, my family, my dad's job took him from Chicago, which is my hometown, to here in Dallas. When I got out of uh, AIT in the fall, I didn't have a job, so I went home. They could have just as easily moved to Boise or Saginaw or anywhere, but Dallas was where they came. And so when I eventually got a job with a small radio station in Dallas that doesn't exist anymore, uh, it, it just started me down the path toward that job led to something else and doing part of that job led to me being heard by someone else and one thing followed another and uh, it, it evolved into uh, now I'm starting my 42nd season uh, wow. broadcasting Dallas Cowboys games and they're not consecutive if, if people try to do the math you'll have a problem because I started <laughs> the 1976 season but in 95, six and seven, I left this job to do Texas Rangers baseball. And I did some national uh, NFL games and college football, but that's why I start in 76 and it's 42 years going into 90. It doesn't add up, uh, except it does. <laughs> Thanks for helping us with the math. That's good. <laughs> and by the way, that's usually, I've got a great statistician a guy named Bob Thomas who's been with me I think Chris Ward knows him and uh, Bob's been with me for close to 40 years. And usually I leave all the math to Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Good deal. Brad, you've, you've mentioned your military service in, in the National Guard. So what was the reasoning behind joining? And then what have you learned from the military that's helped you as a broadcaster? Uh, Leah, the reason behind joining was not um, uh, particularly praiseworthy. I had I was in the first year of the uh, Vietnam lottery, and um, although although my dad served during uh, World War II, he didn't have to go overseas, but he was in the Army Air Corps. Uh, but um, I was in the first year. Uh, I was in the first year of the lottery uh, for the the draft for the Vietnam War. And for all of you who are too young to remember the lottery, <laughs> um, the the National Guard, unlike uh, what we kind of do now and have done for the last several years, uh, at that point in time, the National Guard was and the and the reserves were the last people who went into foreign uh, combat. And so if you had every birth date got a number attached to it and literally pulled out of a hat or out of a hopper, like, like bingo. Mm -hmm. And if you, the estimation was if you were, um, assigned a number about 150 or higher, uh, you were probably not going to have to go. And if it was 200 or higher, it was almost guaranteed. And I was 44 which translates mm -hmm. to rice paddy that I was going. And so there was a real scramble to get into guard and reserve units. You couldn't get in because it wasn't the, the first choice of many young men who had a choice uh, to go fight at that point. I was lucky enough, I was at the University of Missouri and I was lucky enough to get into a, a unit in Kansas City, Kansas. So I, uh, deferred. The drawing was in the fall, and I was able to defer my enlistment until the end of my second semester so I could finish school, but I missed my graduation and my roommate's wedding and went immediately to Fort Polk and was there uh, until I finished AIT. Um, and what was the second question? Because that, oh, what is it? How did it prepare me for being a broadcaster? Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I was very young and I'll never forget my, I, I was not looking forward to going to basic training. Okay. And I'll never forget my grandmother, all four feet, eight of her or whatever she was saying, you know, <laughs> you, it, it'll, you will look back on it and smile and laugh and see that it was a good thing. And I said, yeah, grandma, I'm not quite sure that we're going to get to there, but okay. Uh, <laughs> 
in fact, I would say that as a broadcaster to try to specifically answer your question, uh, it certainly taught me the importance of discipline. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it gave me a real respect for the uh, inherent wisdom of the chain of command and for understanding uh, a greater purpose and, and teamwork. Um, it, we have a half dozen people on our crew that's been together, uh, that's give or take, but it's the same people who have been together for many, many years, a couple of decades. And, and so we really all understand that uh, every one of us, my, my two broadcast partners, Bay Laufenberg, a former NFL quarterback and college mm -hmm. star is my partner in the booth. And we've got a phenomenal sideline reporter christy scales who's multi-talented and she's been with us on the sideline for more than 20 years we're the three voices that people hear but we are none of us any good without the technician ted nichols Payne spinning the dials behind us or without dan miles our producer that's exactly how a military unit functions there are ranks and there's greater authority, but there's no greater importance. The, the lowest woman or man on the chain, forget about pay grade, whoever the lowest one on the chain is, they're as important as the one leading because it takes everybody. Well, military service taught me that better than almost anything else could have in, uh, in my life. So I think it's it's helped me with those things as a broadcaster, Leah, but I think that as a human being, and particularly uh, as we have encountered real uh, turbulence in the world, I think, it has, I think it has helped me with perspective, understanding that there's, there are some things that are just bigger than each of us in the little square mm -hmm. we're in. That's excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that. And first, let me say thank you for your service and welcome home. Yeah, thank you. And as you know, Brad, we have soldiers, airmen, sailors, Marines, Coasties, military families. They're watching from all over the world. Do you have any words of thanks to share with all of our heroes? Yeah, uh, look, uh, yes, of course. And they're no different than most of the words that you all uh, hear all the time, but they're no less heartfelt. And I think it's in, I think it is in, in many, many, many ways harder to serve, particularly overseas today than it's ever been because the world has more menaces, more threats, more different kinds of unseen enemies and treacheries that, that lurk around every corner. It calls for incredible vigilance. And uh, what I do know is that it's easy to be serving, and again, particularly away from home, and no matter what the camaraderie you feel, and really no matter your patriotism, uh, it's easy to think that eh, no one really cares. I, I'm, I'm, me and these people, we're just here, the seven of us, we're just here doing this alone. No, you're not. And there's, there are, there's not enough time in life for all of us, whether we have uh, had the opportunity to serve or not, to express our gratitude for the things that uh, our people in the service do every day. Oh, well, thank you for those, for those kinds of words on behalf of all the service members out there. We appreciate that. So, Brad, let's cut straight to the chase. Let's talk about some football. Chief, do you, you know think... you, say that, you say that to every guest? Let's cut straight to the chase. You are, all... <laughs> oh, I've been you are always cutting straight to the chase. Straight to That's the... cheap. I love it. I love that it. is That's cheap. It. Let's talk about some football, right? Uh, so do you think there's going to be an NFL season this year? And if there is one, how do you envision it uh, happening? So, Chief, I'm, uh, my glass is half full. And so uh, I do believe that there will be. Now, originally I could show you a text exchange I had in 
um, late March with Zach Martin, the all pro guard of the Cowboys, who I think is one of the greatest offensive linemen that's ever, I've ever seen play the game. And, uh, and I said, how do you feel about playing games with no fans? Now this was March. He said, well, that would be weird. I said, well, get your head around it. Uh, I did think that, that we would be further ahead, um, than we are with, um, treatments and medicines and that kind of thing but mm-hmm. especially as the spring wore on and not very far it just seemed to me that and i think the what the nba is doing and the wnba are doing in florida uh, with the with the bubble is a mm-hmm. great example of how it's possible to reasonably control um a a somewhat limited environment and, and I think that hockey is um, probably going to be successful doing it with a different kind of bubble. They're in two places in Canada. And, I, and despite what's happened with the Miami Marlins this week, I think that baseball is uh, going to have some success doing it. It requires great vigilance on the parts of all of the participants, not just players. Um, I, I'm, I'm a big Chicago Cubs fan. Bless my heart. And, uh, and they haven't had a positive case because their guys have great leadership and they are really paying close attention. So the football players are, they need to think of them. So now this is the NFL, not college football, which has a whole different set of problems because of school and, um, and the NCAA rules. But in the NFL, the, each team has to think of itself as a kind of bubble. It's not the same kind of bubble as the NBA because it's too long a season. You can sequester these players uh, as well as coaches and, and support staff. You can sequester them for the period of training camp, but you can't do it for an entire year. They're going to go home to their families. They're going to be to some degree out in the community. And that's the key to what degree are these young men, many of them in their twenties, uh, with a lot of money and a life to try to live, how attentive will they be to the things it takes to be able to play? I think that when we started all of this, particularly in April-ish, I think there was a kind of, uh, certainly in the media and fandom, I think there was an either-or approach to it from our perspective. Either everyone's going to test clean or you have to shut down the whole industry and i don't believe that's the correct answer i think the answer lies in the middle so i think that if i think we are going to have to and baseball is proving this i think we're going to have to get our heads around the fact that every week in the nfl some people are going to test positive and you're going to miss some players because either a guys will get carried away and they'll be out doing things they shouldn't do in big groups or someone else will get it. And pe- if we get our heads around the fact that that is, uh, I don't like to call it the new normal. I was exchanging a text with a friend the other day. I, I refuse to accept any of this as new normal, <laughs> but I will accept it as the now normal. Mm-hmm. It's the now normal. I like so that. if we do that, if we do that and, and accept the fact that some players are going to test positive and miss some games, then uh, I think it's possible to play the season. Wow. You heard it here, what Brad thinks. And I got to tell you, um, my family has been so happy with baseball being back just within the last week. It's really made a difference to us. It gives us something to look forward to. Now. Yeah, we, we're we big Cardinals fans. We love us uh, some Texas Rangers, but we're also big Cards fans. Sorry. Uh, no, you like the Cubs, but no, we'll no, let no. that slide. Okay. I, think St. Louis, I think St. Louis is the best baseball town in America. I think of the smartest. Amen. Yep. Sophisticated fans. <laughs> great rivalry between the Cubs and Cardinals. Yep. Uh, but I, I think St. Louis is a great baseball town. It's baseball heaven for sure. And uh, you mentioned that uh, just a little bit, but you did you know, you've done more than 40 years with the Cowboys, but there was that three-year period when you broadcast Texas Rangers games. So what was the reason for that? And then why'd you come back to football? Well, the, <laughs> we don't have enough time. But we the asked reason, the tough questions. <laughs> yeah. The reason for that was essentially that I got um, into a little riff that 
might have been avoidable, but maybe not, with the, the then uh, head coach, Barry Switzer. And um, so I said some things in a, an impromptu pre-game, pre-season uh, broadcast that um, he didn't like and that Jerry Jones uh, wasn't too fond of, although most of it was aimed at Barry. Uh, and uh, they, they were, in my opinion, there were things that were accurate and correct and probably uh, better said somewhere else. And so there was some tension. And at the end of that season, that was 1994, at the end of that season, the Texas Rangers had a change both of radio station for the first time in decades and um, w their, their great broadcaster, uh, lead broadcaster at the time, now the late Mark Holtz had to, uh, when, the, when the team changed radio stations, he couldn't go, he had to do TV because his wife was ill. And so Eric Nadell, who is in the Baseball Hall of Fame and the media wing and an old friend of mine, knew I loved baseball and so gave me the opportunity to go work with him, relieve the tension um, uh, that, uh, that I had with uh, Coach Switzer, uh, for whom I have the greatest professional respect. And um, after three years, the Rangers um, president at the time, um, called me in and said, uh, I think you're a really good broadcaster. And every time I hear your voice, I hear a cowboy game in my head. Now I've been with the Cowboys by that. I, I had done 18 years, I think of the Cowboys and three of the Rangers. And I said, well, uh, I, I could try to dissuade you, but I think your mind is made up. And so I actually went to work for a CBS radio at the Winter Olympics in Nagano, Japan. Oh, cool. And yeah. while I was there, and, and, and I essentially didn't have a job uh, when I got back. And when I, while I was there, uh, Coach Switzer got fired. And I got a call from a man named Ron Chapman, one of the greatest living broadcasters in, uh, in American radio history and uh, the best boss I ever had. And he called me in Nagano and he said, um, the Cowboys have made a coaching change. Would you like to come back? And I said, let me think about it for a minute. Yes. <laughs> and, so, and so I came back in 98 and, uh, and I had a whole speech in my head that I was going to give Jerry Jones about how, look, just so we understand now I have to be me and I have to, I'm not going to uh, pick fights, but I have to be honest. And, and I never got a chance to say a word when I went into his office because Jerry just said, look, you're back where you belong. We love you. And we think this is where you should be. And we're thrilled to have you back. And uh, it, it's, and so it was great before that and continues to be. Oh, do you and like, do you and like Jerry Jones and some of these, you know, uh, executives like hang out at the cigar <laughs> bar, have like a cocktail. Oh gosh, chief. <laughs> chief. Is that, is I that how it works? On that level. Chief, I'm not on that level. We, we're, I, I have great positive feelings uh, for Jerry. I'm a, I'm a little closer to a couple of his kids who are um, important executives with the team. I've never been to Jerry's home. I haven't been on the 85-foot uh, yacht or whatever it is that he's on all the time. <laughs> I've, I've been on his helicopter, I think, once or twice. Uh, no, we're not, we're not hanging out. But he did, unfortunately, he did... Uh, pass to me a an affection for Johnny Walker Blue, just so you oh. know. <laughs> that's a good, that's that's a good stuff. Nice. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's not cheap. That stuff's not cheap. No. <laughs> wow. There's a lot of Brad Sham fans out there. So you're getting a lot of likes and loves, lots of good comments. Uh, you. When you were talking about your military service, Johnny Olson said, Either you're in infantry or you're supporting infantry. So there you go. <laughs> Levin Bravo. Thanks, Johnny. <laughs> Johnny, Johnny's an awesome teammate of ours. And then I guess Jose's replying to him and says, Is there anything else besides infantry? <laughs> Lots of people are just saying thank you. Um, oh, Johnny also says, 
cubbies and Christopher says, great insight, Brad. Thank you. There's a question. Did I miss in anything, Do we have that? Are we asking that? Yeah, there's a question out there. Yeah, we, I question? think we have that one covered. We, we have that one covered. All right, All right Matthew, mm -hmm. we'll ask that in a minute. Um, hold on, let me see where, where am I at up here. So for those of you in the audience that may not notice, a few years ago, the Cowboys designated the Brad Sham home radio booth at AT&T Stadium in honor of your illustrious career with the team. What did that mean to you, Brad? You know, uh, Chief, that, that was two years ago. That was to commemorate my 40th season. And, um, you know, I think uh, Michelle asked before, you know, did you, did you think about being, no, you don't, you know, you, when you're young and you're trying to get a job, uh, you, you don't think about anything like that. You think about trying to keep your job. And that's still what I'm thinking. A very good friend of mine said to me, sent me a congratulatory note when they did that. And he said, that's great that they named the booth after you. Just remember, you still have to have a credential to get in. And that's exactly right. Uh, it, it, was, it was a really nice, it was beyond nice. It was a phenomenal thing to do. Uh, and usually to get something like that done, you have to die. So I'm, I'm really grateful that they didn't. I, I, Chief, I've got a passion for my job. I love it. I, now, I really believe that that uh, one reason I love it more every year is that I'm very well aware that there are fewer in front of me than behind me. But um, I, I just can't even describe to you how much I love every part of it. I've said to people for a long time, when you are doing something that you really, really love, every job, no matter how much you love it, has some drudgery. It, that's why it's called a job. And, and all parts of it are not roses and glitter and glamour. But when you really have a passion and love it, then the parts that you hate, you love those parts. You learn to love what you hate. And that's how I feel about my job. The worst parts of it, I love them because they're parts of it. And uh, now we're getting to the time. This is going to be a tremendously different training camp. This is the first time that I've been home at the end of July in 23 years because we're in oh, camp that's awesome. now. And so uh, in a couple of weeks, they're going to start having practices at the Star in Frisco, Texas. And I'm probably going to be one of about 10 or 15 people allowed to be there live to watch it and you so you watch practice and you break down tape and you try to figure out who's going to be this is the construction of the team and I almost love almost love the preparation for a game more than I love the game not quite I love the game but I the, but the preparation is a, is a huge part of it so so what that meant to me I guess was that I, I had been around a very, very long time, but I remember saying to Jerry, they had a, they had a tremendous surprise ceremony for me before the, that game, an opener against the New York Giants. And I said, I'm truly moved. I'd never expected anything like this. I don't really know what to say other than um, I'm not planning on leaving soon. So I can't imagine if this is what you're doing now, what you're going to do in 10 years when I hit my 50th year. So God willing, that's, <laughs> that's my plan. So what is a typical week like for you in preparing for a game? And then what is game day itself like? Home game or road game? Both. <laughs> so for a, home game, for a home game, regular season week, Sunday game, um, uh, you have to have, and I, look, I'm not as young as I was once upon a time, Toby Keith's great song. I'm not as, as good as I once was, but I'm as good once as I ever was. Um, <laughs> I, that's all of I, us. I, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We're all so right there. <laughs> I try on Monday morning to give myself a little breathing room. Um, I just watch something on my, uh, TiVo or read or it's kind of hard to sleep in too much during the season, but I try to get a little break. By Monday afternoon, uh, depending on what the coaches, now we, none of us knows what Mike McCarthy's regimen will be, but uh, usually on Monday afternoon, you're going to have um, 
some period of an open locker room where player interviews will be available. So I'm, I'm doing that and you're talking to players and you're starting to finish the deconstruction of yesterday's game and begin focusing on what you're needing to know for the next week's game. And there's that builds up incrementally. Tuesday's the player's day off. And so usually there's a little more space to do things like, you know, go to the grocery and take out your dry cleaning, but also the league statistics come out on Tuesday after the Monday night game. And that's a packet that gets bigger as the season goes on. And so I think one of the things I've had to learn is uh, it, it, the, especially a radio audience doesn't want to be drowned in statistics. Mm -hmm. And I have to figure out which of this packet of statistics are meaningful and will add to their understanding and enhancement uh, of the, wow of the game and what do I throw away? So you're spending some time on Tuesday online. Uh, you're reading things about the other team. You're, you're uh, trying to digest the league statistics and there is tape to watch. I, I try to, even though I just saw them, I try to watch the tape again of the Cowboys game because the, I have to watch the ball. So line play fascinates me. I think it's the ultimate team sport and there's a lot to watch about why something worked or didn't. And then you start watching the tape of the last game of the team you're about to play. So you go through that and try to figure out what you need to know about them. And then there's more reading and more statistics and more interviews and uh, every day building up through the week. And um, I uh, also have a responsibility to the uh, Cowboys radio network to do a um, daily report uh, that's usually built around an interview. So that involves some writing and mm -hmm. editing and recording. And uh, usually on Monday night, I'm doing an interview show for our flagship mm -hmm. station with a couple of players. And, and so that just all builds through the week, kind of like putting a game plan together. Now, the idea, my idea is that by Saturday, I'm done. I've never been done on set. <laughs> <laughs> Wishful never, never thinking, happened. right? <laughs> That's like never, plans. Ever you just really want to feel like when you walk uh, into the stadium on Sunday that you uh, have overprepared because you sure. won't use everything that you did. But the great challenge for me is when, when the unexpected happens in this game and it's going to, will I be prepared to handle it? And that's what the week's worth of preparation is. Now, if it's a, if it's a home game, then um, I, I live in no traffic, about roughly 30 minutes from the stadium. And um, game day traffic gives me a stomach ache. And I don't like to feel that way uh, on game day. So I will get to the stadium about three to three and a half hours before the game. Now, in the, every year in the past, I like to go down on the field before the game and talk to players and coaches. Yeah. You actually learn more in that period than you do all week. They're, they're a very nervous bunch, coaches especially. They don't <laughs> want to. And then on game day, somehow they feel like uh, you, you can't hurt them anymore and they'll open a vein. And so you can really learn a lot. Of stuff. <laughs> but I don't know if we're going to be allowed that opportunity mm. this year. If it's a road game when I, and I travel with the team, then the bus has a police escort. So they depend that uh, depending on the coach, Jason Garrett liked to get there two and a half hours before the game. Every coach has his own schedule, sure. but so you know maybe maybe depending where you're staying, roughly three hours before a game is when you leave. Might be two forty-five, and then for a uh, road game, we're on the plane and the game ends. Clean up, do the post-game show on the bus on the plane home which is why I hate road night games. Cause that means I'm <laughs> home at like 3 a.m. or 5 a.m. Oh. So let's, all right, here we go, right? Got a couple of questions here. But the first you one is- You were gonna say cut to the chase, weren't you? You were gonna yeah, say it I, I was gonna say, let's cut to the chase here. Cause a lot of people <laughs> wanna know. So we were on there actually 30 of June, almost 30, yeah, about 30, 31 days. A month ago. With Ar yeah. yeah, about a month ago with Aaron Rodgers. And I don't think we brought this up on the air. It was after he hung around for like 15, 20 minutes with us. And we asked him, catch or no catch? And he stood by his answer. He was like, that was not a catch. According yeah. to the rules of the NFL, 
at of that point that. in time. Of course he <laughs> So what do you say? What do you say, oh, Mr. He caught the Mr. ball. Shane? Come on. He caught the ball. He dove where he dove for the ball. He the ball did not independently contact the ground. His hands were on it and <laughs> he ooched forward before in the end zone. He had it. He broke the plane. He committed a football move. He hmm. took a and the ball came out. It's a catch. Catch. Well, Brad says go. catch. And I'll tell you something You're else. Brad, I'll tell you something else. That's not the first one of those kind of things I've been involved with. So I was in the first few years that I uh, worked on the Cowboy broadcast, I did color for the great Vern Lundquist, great Hall of Fame broadcaster. Uh, and he was the Cowboys lead play by play announcer on the radio while he was doing college football on TV. And I would, this is really prehistoric days, I would actually leave the booth the last five minutes of the game, go down on the field so that I could tape the post game interviews while he finished up. So when the Cowboys played at San Francisco in 1980, um, whatever it was, the catch, the catch game, Joe Montana to the late great Dwight Clark, uh, I'm standing on the Cowboys sideline and Montana is flushed out of the pocket by Ed Jones and uh, Larry Bethay, may he rest in peace. And he is running on the side and he is running right at me. And I'm telling you, and I've talked to Joe Montana about this and he's like Aaron Rodgers. He says, no, Joe Montana says, oh, we practice that all the time. That play to Dwight Clark. We practice that. I think it was 83. We practice that all the time. That was definitely, I was throwing it to Dwight in the back of the end zone. Horse hockey. You were throwing it away. I, I was watching you with my eyes. So Aaron Rodgers can say whatever he wants. Um, he was down on the bench. He wasn't even looking at the play. He's not watching his team's defense play. It was a catch. A battle of the I chief chat guests right here. I will point this out, however. <laughs> Cowboy fans are fond of saying that cost them the game and a shot at the Super Bowl. No. There were about four minutes left, and Aaron Rodgers – is a cinch hall of famer one of the great quarterbacks we've ever seen now he was playing with a really bad uh, i think it was a quad injury it could have been a calf but he couldn't run he could barely walk the cowboys pass rush was anemic uh, ha had been inadequate all year and rogers then uh after the no catch on one leg limping around just took him bing 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 right down the field and they scored and he would have done the same thing it wasn't like that was the last play of the game to des bryant even if it was a catch then rogers was going to take him down and score that's just how it was wow wow and to follow that up i mean you're, you're very passionate about that just like all the other football fans out there mm -hmm. i'm telling you these cowboys fans all Green Bay fans, no, it wasn't a catch. It was, I hear it all from both sides. What was your most memorable moment or your most memorable broadcasting moment, if there is one? I mean, there, you know, yeah, there's years, I, a lot of games. I will tell you that uh, there have been a lot. I'm, I'm obviously blessed. And uh, when you say my most memorable moment, um, standing on the field of the Rose Bowl, three hours, three and a half hours before kickoff of Super Bowl 27, this team had won one game in uh, in 1989 and three games in 88. And so here they came back from then to 92 and they're in the Super Bowl and standing on that field with uh, the, the way only parts of Southern California can do. There's the sun is shining. There's still dew on the grass in the early afternoon, but the mountains are in the background. It was an, it was God's handiwork. And I remember standing there looking around saying, well, this is perfect. This is just, can we not play the game? Can we just go home and just say we won? And, uh, but broadcasting chief uh, in 1979, I was working with Vern. Vern was a, uh, called by ABC to do a boxing tournament in Japan with Sugar Ray Lewis. So I did a couple of games play by play with uh, the Cowboys great safety, Charlie Waters, who was out injured that year. And the middle of December, they played Washington in the last game of the regular season. It turned out to be Roger Staubach's last regular season game. 
I still think it's the best football game I've ever seen. Uh, there probably were eight or 10 Hall of Famers on the field. Uh, Washington went up and down the field. They had a two touchdown lead late. Uh, Dallas fought back and fought back because Staubach just would not let them quit. And uh, so inside the two minute warning, Washington has a six point lead and the ball uh, somewhere around their own 20. And, and they're out, Dallas is out of timeouts. Washington's only got to make a first down and the game's over. And they ran a toss play to John Riggins, Hall of Famer, uh, who had taken the exact same play 66 yards for a touchdown earlier in the game. And the Cowboys had a defensive tackle named Larry Cole, who was one of the smartest, slowest players that ever lived. And he diagnosed that play from the pitch, from the time Joe Theismann took the handoff, turned and tossed it to his Larry Cole could see exactly what they were doing. And he ran in between a bunch of defenders and he got to Riggins. Larry Cole couldn't outrun John Riggins a day in either one of their lives, but he beat him to the sideline that time. And he tackled him for a loss and Dallas with no timeouts gets the ball back under two minutes and Staubach who is missing two or three of his best players to injury. Bink, 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 bink down the field, tying touchdown with two seconds left extra point wins the game Washington winds up missing the playoffs Cowboys win the east best football game I've ever seen wow That's, I feel like I was there just hearing you <laughs> tell this like I was four but I feel like I was there <laughs> that's my job Chief was intensely listening to that I don't I know everybody else could not see Chief but Chief was He's really like intensely listening yeah, this, 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 this was this was chief me y'all leads, chief leads the conversation by saying look i, I i'm not a sports guy so <laughs> they have been intensely listening trying to figure out what the hell is he talking about what <laughs> what's a pitch what the hell's a pitch yeah what is <laughs> oh my gosh chief, chief. <laughs> but that's I, 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 I got an idea i got an idea i used to play some video games uh so i got, I got an idea <laughs> all right We'll my four three, my four one. three, my my dime defense. Yeah, good. Okay, you yeah, know all yeah. those verbs. That's okay. great. Yeah, from, from the video <laughs> games. <laughs> <laughs> oh I learned that. Gosh. Hey, so so Brad Sham, I learned I learned that yesterday from Amon Green. I think he used to play for the Green Bay Packers. So he's not like an esports coach. So yes. he's just throwing out all these words. Yeah, yes. he's using all these words. So I was like, oh yeah, all right. Yeah, he's time. a great player. There's a lot of money to be made in esports. Don't kid yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. So Brad, over the years, you've covered a lot of great Cowboys teams, but you've also had to suffer through some pretty bad seasons. How do you remain upbeat and optimistic in the booth when the product on the field just isn't performing? Leah, I remember that they, they had three years in a row when they were five and 11. Um, they got in some salary cap trouble and some guys they tried to, mm -hmm. some guys they signed, got hurt, didn't work out. Dave Campo was their coach. I remember a conversation I had with him and, and they were a bad five and 11. Um, I, I remember walking into the stadium, one of those days, Texas stadium then. And, and, and in those days I would walk, I would usually go right down to the field. So I walked in on the concourse and I would walk down through the stands and they were five and 11 and they were bad and they were going to get beat. And we all knew they were going to get beat. And, and I'm walking down the stands, looking around the stadium, looking up at the names in the ring of honor, thinking of where I am and how lucky I am to be there. And I remember saying to Dave, uh, I, I can't believe how much I love doing this job, even when things aren't going well. And he said, me too. I'm so lucky to be doing this. So that's the short answer. The uh, unfortunate thing, or depending on your point of view, fortunate, uh, I don't hide my uh, disgust very well. And, and I'm a fan first. I'm a big sports fan. And I think most of us who do what I do for a living, I, I think most of us are fans before we do this for a living. And, and then when you do it for a team and you get to know the players and the coaches and you understand that they're, they're not robots, they are not those little uh, pixelated people that chief's talking about on the on the ea sports game those are human beings with feelings and mothers and children and 
flaws and and you get to know them and, and it's hard not to pull for them and what sure. and then anyone who will tell you anyone who's ever had the opportunity to be a broadcaster for a team will tell you and particularly in Dallas and particularly with the Cowboys when they win and I've had guys tell me I've, they, the guy I deal with for automobiles tells me we sell more cars when they win hmm. people when you stop to fill up your car Remember when you had to fill up your car? Remember those days? Uh, when you <laughs> car, people are in a better mood. They're in a better mood in the grocery store. When they don't win, and if, if I had a dollar for every time this has happened, I go to worship and I hand out prayer books and, and I'm greeted with, what's wrong with the Cowboys? And <laughs> why, why in the heck is that? Can I just give you a prayer book? Can we just... <laughs> no, what's... So, so you want them to win. And so when they play poorly, and I, I have a kind of a visceral reaction. Now I try to maintain professionalism. I like to think I wouldn't still be doing it 42 years in if I didn't have um, some way to maintain some professionalism. And when I think they've played dumb, I don't, results, results are not guaranteed. I think I learned this being a Cub fan, but I've never bought a ticket to a game of any kind where when you read the fine print, it tells you all the rules and the things to expect and the things you can do and the things you can't do. Nowhere in there does it say, and they're going to win the game. So what I want of my team that I invest emotion in, you've got a Cardinals pennant back there on your. I on do. Your, so <laughs> when you, when you bought that pennant or someone bought it for you and you look at it and you've got, pictures of games back there when you invest that emotion what sh what what should you expect I hate the word should but what what do you think it's okay for you to expect i think play smart play hard represent me well play to the whistle but clean um do your best when they play dumb um I, yeah i don't react well so people mm -hmm. can tell that and i don't really stay upbeat um sometimes if you can t if they get you know four touchdowns stuck on them in the first quarter and it's going to be one of those days then you just find the humor and keep in mind it you know what well, it's just a football game i mean literally literally no one's dying out here today when you're when you're in the armed forces and you are engaged in combat or preparation for combat or supportive combat, um, there can be dire consequences. Losing a football game is not a dire consequence. So I try to keep that in mind uh, when things are going really badly. But if, they, if they're if they dumb, I try never, I try, you can say that's a dumb play. You never want to say, what a dummy that guy is. There's a big difference. <laughs> yeah, true. But, uh, but, but um, you, you just, I can't hide my emotions completely. <laughs> hey, Brad, so before we go, I'm gonna give you, uh, the floor is gonna be yours, but there's a comment here. Somebody wrote, I have no clue what this means. Maybe you understand it. Ron Hughes asks, I wonder what he remembers about Fran can't win a Super Bowl Tarkington. I don't know what that means. Well, you know, uh, you know I don't know who Fran is. Tarkenton was, you don't know who Fran Tarkenton is? Never heard of him. Oh, chief. Bless your heart. Right uh, <laughs> uh, I should just, <laughs> I should tell you, go Google him and take your headphones off. Um, All right. <laughs> Fran Tarkenton was, was really one of the most entertaining quarterbacks who ever lived and, and did never won a Super Bowl. And he's a Hall of Famer, and he played. He was a great star for the Vikings, and played also for the Giants. And and I remember, in fact, the very first uh, full season, I, my second year, 1977. Uh, I will not forget the Cowboys playing. They opened the season against the Minnesota Vikings at what was then Metropolitan Stadium, an outdoor facility, right where the Mall of America is today in Bloomington, Minnesota. And the starting quarterbacks were Roger Staubach and Fran Tarkenton. And I'm sitting there watching, thinking, I think I'm getting paid today. Holy cow, <laughs> what is this? Uh, 
what I remember about Tarkenton is that he was really one of the most exciting players uh, who ever played. And, uh, and he didn't win a Super Bowl. And there are, there are some Hall of Famers. Dan Marino comes to mind. Jim Kelly comes to mind. Uh, they didn't win Super Bowls. I really think, it, and, and Chief, this is on you because you said the floor is mine. I really That's... think that in, in our society, now I'm not talking about a military mission. When we get our orders, when we know what our mission is, there's a clear reason for it. And usually the objectives and the path toward the objectives uh, are pretty clear, even if we don't understand it. But I'm talking about uh, society at large. I think that we have lost sight of what winning is because we treat everything. We treat first grade spelling bees the way we treat the Stanley Cup. The only winner is the one holding up the trophy at the end. No, I, I dispute that. And, and, and again, I'm not talking about a military mission. That's a whole different thing. Um, if you adhere to those shoulds that that i mentioned a minute ago did you play your best did you play hard did you leave it all out there if you're playing an athletic contest whether it's golf or tennis or a team sport against other human beings you guess what sometimes they're better sometimes they're better you can only do what you can do so the buffalo bills of jim kelly lost four consecutive super bowls and what most people hear from that is they lost four Super Bowls. And what I hear from that is they went to four straight Super Bowls. You know how hard that is to go to four straight Super Bowls? That's really a hard thing to do. And, and, and the fact of the matter is it, it's hard to make the step from uh, high school athletics to professional athletics. And it's really hard to make the step from professional athletics to stardom. So everyone doesn't get to be a champion, but that doesn't mean that people who don't win championships are losers. Now, I, I know that Fran Tarkenton from time to time could be a little uh, brusque uh, with fans. And that's a shame because um, I, I like the ones who have time for the people who put them where they are. Uh, but for the most part, Fran Tarkenton was an entertainer uh, and a tremendous quarterback who played a different kind of game than was being played then. And the fact that he didn't win a Super Bowl uh, does not diminish him as a football player to me. What I hope we all can remember as we engage with our children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews, people where we're all role models, whether we're, whether we're grown up or not, we're adults. And that means we're role models. Charles Barkley once famously said, I didn't in sign on to be anybody's role model. Well, but tough, Chuck, yes, you did. As soon as you put on the uniform. You, and by the way, that also applies to people in the military. Chief walks out to go to lunch when we're done and he's in uniform, that represents something. People look at him and say, look at that uniform. He is now a role model. Whatever he does is now casts a light on everyone who wears the uniform. And it doesn't have to be fair. That's just how it is. And that's how we are as adults. So I think that what we, what we need to uh, engender in our young is the sense of complete effort and accomplishment. And just do absolutely the most you can all the time. And then maybe we can look at somebody like Fran Tarkenton, who had a great career, and um, realize that the fact that he didn't play in the Super Bowl is not the most important thing. Wow, thank you for those words of wisdom. And actually, Ron Hughes wrote, great answer, sir. Tarkenton entertained me every game. He put, he, put it, he put it all out there, mm -hmm. is what he said. So with that, Mr. Sham, Brad Sham, thank you for your service. 42 years with the Dallas Cowboys. Hopefully uh, Jerry Jones is watching and he decides to give you a nice retirement gift when you do decide to retire. No, don't even nice, say uh, the word, Chief. Don't put that idea in anybody's mind. I can't. No, no. Don't speak <laughs> it. 
He's going to get you a, hey, maybe he'll get you a yacht that you could use at, at Joe Pool. <laughs> nice. oh, I don't even want that out in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> He's, Mr. Champ is going to be there forever. He's going to host the Cowboys games. I look go. forward. I look forward uh, um, to, to listening to you. I actually watched some of the highlights beforehand to kind of get a feel for it. And just like Judy said earlier, I felt like when you were describing some of the games, I was like, man, I felt like I was, I was actually there. When you talked about Joe Montana coming to the side, you know, coming at you and all that and that play. Looking right at me. Telling yeah, you. looking right at you. Like you knew he wasn't throwing the ball where he was supposed to. <laughs> but um, thank you for spending time with us. Um, thank you, Chief. Stick, stick around. Thank you, Leah. This. Thank you, Julie. Thanks. Thank I you, could um, listen to you talk yeah. all day. Yeah. You have the best voice. Just keep all on talking. <laughs> so yeah. great. This, this means so much to our Airmen, Soldiers, Sailors, Marines, Coasty, and family members. We wish you all the best in the upcoming season, and we look forward to hearing you on the air. Thanks. Exchange out.